these little short intros are tough. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, this 5 Watt Live is very appropriately brought to you with the support of my good friends at TrueFire. Uh, more about TrueFire later on in the stream. I'm laughing at myself because I, I'm, I'm getting old hand at this so much so that I am, uh, I was pasting the link to the music that you heard in the intro, that little snippet is the very end of a video that John Cordy made called 99 Years of Tone, where he's playing a 64 Stratocaster through a 1979 Fender Champ amplifier. So uh, yeah, I was just putting that over there. Um, you know, with the new year, it's often a time when we take a look at our goals. I do. Uh, for me, it just includes thinking about what it is that I want to accomplish on the guitar. Uh, as an old saying, if you don't make a plan, someone will make a plan for you. Um, I think about that all the time. So to stay in touch with what we want to get from our guitar playing, I thought we should take some time and sit back and think about lessons. Take an honest look at ourselves as a player and decide what we want to do and what we want to get to this year. Um, so how you're going to get to that probably includes some lessons. Cool? Cool. Stay with me and uh, I'll try to throw some quizzes along the way. Uh, we have uh, Baby Ninja. I guess he doesn't use the Ninja anymore. It's funny. I I find I found Baby back in the day. I mean, a long time ago. And uh, with his handle, I thought he was uh, in Japan. So I would like send him little notes in Japanese, and he would respond in Japanese because Baby knows everything. Um, so anyway, Bebe. Um, I even get the accents right. There's our buddy Bebe. There we go. We're back. Um, uh, I don't know how long Bevy can hang around today, but if you have questions, uh, he's always good for answers. Uh, he's always uh, he's always right on it, <laughs> keeping me honest. Uh, the music, as I said in the intro, was John Cordy. I'm going to talk a little bit about John Cordy and the way I actually have kind of come to using John's uh, channel as a way to learn uh, myself, part of my own uh, journey. I'm editing a video. I've been editing for two days. Uh, so, which you guys get like every couple of weeks, you get me in an, in an editing blur, uh, coming out of four to eight hours of editing, going into the live stream. And I appreciate your kindness and charity, uh, putting up with my, uh, adult self. Uh, if I uh, didn't forget, uh, before I wanted to let you know that we have more of the, um, five watt world, David Barber, Barber electronics bus overdrives. They're back in stock again. They're over on the reverb page. The link is in the description. Um, we did a live stream on that. So if you missed that, go back and check it out called Creation of an Overdrive. We're going to do, <laughs> I talked to David about this the other day. We're going to do a video on how David, somebody put in the comments, how do you get a whole amplifier into one of those little tiny pedals? And David was actually mesmerized, fascinated by the question. And so we're going to do a live stream at some point in the near future. Uh, relatively near future about how David sort of goes about trying to not just replicate just sounds, but the feel of a tube driven amplifier in uh, a little tiny pedal. All right. I remember if you have a comment or a question, go ahead and put a question mark in a space. I'll try to catch it. Uh, I see lots of good uh, friends of five watt here. I enjoy it. You guys, it's good to see all the familiar, I say faces when of course, what I mean is names in the chat. Um, so, uh, I like it, like it, <laughs> purple, let's, let me show this purple, let I can't say it. Lucha Salen. What's up? Hypes. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. We don't, no one calls me hypes except Rick. <laughs> and we're going to come to that. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I did a video four years ago, very early in the channel. Um, and I'm kind of revisiting some of that because I actually went back and rewatched it. I got interviewed by a guy from CNN uh, about my good friend, Mr. Beato. And answering those questions, I referred this guy to the video because I talk about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I have some slides um, that I have of materials. But around the reason I did the original video was I read an interview with Mark Knopfler. Uh, this is years ago. I think it's three or four years ago. Um, and in that interview in Guitarist Magazine, he said that he feels like every every once in a while, he feels like he needs to take some guitar lessons. And I, I, I love this because Knopfler is, of course, a hero to many, many of us here. And Knopfler said, and I quote, I'd like to have a guitar teacher come around on Tuesday mornings or something and ring the bell and not set me a load of theory, but just talk about a little passage or a little sequence and leave it with me to go through the next week. That's exciting to me. 
that would be exciting to me because I've never had a teacher like that. I don't want to start learning a load of shit that I'm not interested in, but there's lots and lots of other stuff I'd like to get into. Uh, that's his word. I wasn't swearing on my channel. I was, it was a quote. <laughs> anyway, I remember thinking at the time, if, if Knopfler needs to take lessons, then I need to take lessons for sure. <laughs> Absolutely need to take lessons. All right. So that's it. This coming summer will mark um, for me 50 years of playing the guitar. Yeah, I got to take a break every time I say that out loud. That this summer will take will set us up for fifty years of playing guitar. Um, for me, uh, so this is my lesson journey. And the interesting thing was, well, I'll come to it. Um, like a lot of people, I, I I begged for a guitar when I was ten years old. These stories that I'm telling about the George Harrison guitars all kind of revolve around um, my father playing Abbey Road over and over again. So I was ten years old when that record came out. And so I begged for a guitar and they rented me a guitar, uh, a Stella or something that was completely unplayable. And they set me up with a guitar teacher in town who wanted me to play Twinkle Little Star um, from the Mel Bay book. And I just wanted to play the Beatles. And that lasted maybe the whole summer. Maybe. I don't think so. Um, and then, of course, I came back to it when I was 14. Um, like most people, I thought that... Um, Girls would think that was a, a cool thing that a guy, and actually probably in 1974, they sort of did, I guess, thought that I could play guitar. I was probably way too shy to sing out loud then. Um, I should be now, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so I was basically from that point forward, I was self-taught. Uh, I learned chords from books of songs. You could buy uh, song books and they would have little chord charts and I would learn chords that way and I would collect them up and, um, and I would play guitar with people at church and there would be a song in in a song at church that I didn't know and I'd have to turn to the head of the folk group and I'd say I I, I don't know B7 what's that's a lot of that's a lot of fingers B7 how do I play that and they would show me and I'd go home till the next Sunday you know after rehearsal after you know church and then hopefully I will have learned the new chords by the next week uh, I wouldn't really take guitar lessons until I got to college and when I went to college in the late 70s and you said, I want to, I want to take some guitar courses. What they heard was, I want to take some classical guitar lessons. <laughs> it's not, that's not what I was saying, but that's what they heard. And so um, they helped me find a classical guitar teacher in town. And I bought an inexpensive Yamaha classical guitar. Um, and I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. And in the time that I was studying with Dennis Monroe, who was the guy I studied guitar with uh, in Rochester, uh, I got good enough to eventually play with a couple of his other students in a guitar quartet uh, that we just called simply the Rochester Guitar Quartet. And we played some gigs around town, art show openings and those kinds of things. And it was another type of experience for me playing um, with a group of people, which was really, really wonderful. Um, and then, as you guys have heard me say before, as I came to the end of college, I really got into straight ahead jazz. And after college, um, I, I went looking for a jazz guitar teacher. And I'm going to go ahead and read you my story of, um, of that. Because uh, in the original video, I said, let me tell you a story. In 1987, I was working in admissions at Ithaca College. And I decided it was time to take some jazz guitar lessons. I called the head of the jazz department, Steve Brown. And he said he was too busy, but he had a new faculty member that he could probably work with me. So he handed me off to this guy. but you probably know him better as this guy. And Rick Beato became my jazz guitar teacher. Um, we met in his office and he asked me to outline what it was that I wanted to learn and what I would and what I was able to do already. I explained my background and what I wanted to accomplish. He listened and then he asked for a piece of staff paper, which he told me to bring with me to the lessons. And he started writing rapidly. And this is the piece of paper he handed back to me. I still have it. He made sure I could play through the chords to get through a 251. And then he handed me the handwritten changes to all the things you are and sent me home to practice those. Therein would follow an intense couple of years of guitar lessons with Rick. Uh, he was gigging around town and I would go uh, see him with my girlfriend to see him play. And he would call me up onto the bandstand frequently. <laughs> I was a beginning jazz student, 
but we both had a common love of Pat Metheny. And we'd actually figured out that we had, we grew up close enough to each other that we'd actually been to a number of Pat Metheny shows at the same time. We just didn't know each other. We also were at the show uh, at the Eastman Theater when Weather Report was there with Jacob Pistorius. So we had all this kind of musical shared background. But anyway, Rick would call me up in the bandstand and he'd say, hey, Hypes, this was a nickname that Rick and I gave each other when we knew each other at Ithaca College. And that's why only he and I call each other that. He'd say, Hypes, you know the changes to Meth's, Metheny's, he'd say Meth's, Metheny's Unity Village, right? Come on up and play it and with me on the break. So I'd try to wave him off and he would hear none of it. <laughs> Absolutely not let me do that. He said, don't worry, you can just run the changes. You don't need to solo. And so I'd go up there and after he st stated the melody, you can see this coming, he'd turn to me and quietly say, take it and really <laughs> quietly so the people up front couldn't hear as if it was everybody knew it was my turn to solo. And it was pretty ugly, but it was an experience. And of course, I didn't realize, I didn't realize at the time, um, but I did in years afterwards because I hadn't taken a lot of jazz, I hadn't taken a lot of lessons on guitar, period. But I realized over the long run why Rick was a great guitar teacher, even then, because he went on to um, teach. He was teaching there then. He taught college for five years. And then he taught uh, when he had, went on to do his band to make a living, to pay rent and eat. He taught guitar lessons like a lot of musicians do. And he and I figured it out one day. He taught guitar lessons um, over 60, 70 students a week for five years. And that adds up to about 12,000 guitar lessons. So if you ever are watching Rick and you're wondering, how did he ever get so good at explaining things about music? The answer is that he practiced. I teased him the other day that he did a postgraduate work uh, program of 10 years of learning how to talk to people about, about music and help people understand. So I'm going to run through a few things that I think you need. And I'm going to talk about what you should be looking for in a live teacher, understanding completely that not everybody can find a live guitar teacher. And it's really hard to find a live guitar teacher, but I'm gonna tell you the things that the, the guitar teacher that you find ought to do. And if they're not doing these things, then you should go ahead and find a new guitar teacher. And uh, I imagine it's like a therapist. You need to find somebody who speaks your language, you need to some, find somebody who listens, and um, well, we'll see how, long the, how well the metaphor fold, holds up here. The first thing is that a good guitar teacher should listen more than they talk or play. Um, I, I've lost track of the number of friends of mine, and they tell me that they're taking guitar lessons with like the best guitar player in town. I'm like, what's it like taking lessons with him? You know, because I'd heard of the guitar player, but I hadn't never taken a lesson with the guy. He's like, well, mostly I ask him what I, you know, tell him what I want to learn. And then he plays that kind of for the rest of the time. And I'm like, well, then do you play it? Yeah, not really. And I've actually found that this is a thing where people understand how to play music, but they haven't really thought a lot about how to teach music. Um, and I think that that's the critical difference here that we're talking about is you want somebody who makes the next step. You want the person that just listening um, to your playing, although you want them to do that. You want them to listen to what your, it is you're trying to accomplish, kind of like Rick did in that very first meeting. What is it you're trying to do here that makes sense? And then let's set up a, a program up to do that. I actually have an entire sheaf of, um, is that a word? Sheaf? Yeah, I think so. Uh, a whole pile of paper that is handwritten uh, chord charts and things, because Rick knew my reading was even still pretty weak. I kind of snuck through my classical playing by ear. Um, I read recently that Van Halen actually played the piano by ear and he got his teachers to play the pieces and then he would learn them by ear. I, I'm not Van Halen, not in the least, but I did sort of sneak by. I could almost read, but if I heard it, I had it. I've always an ear player. So anyway, so um, you want them to be listening to what you're trying to accomplish. You want to kind of revisit that. And, and kind of like uh, our experience with the medical profession these days, you have to be your own contractor. You have to get in there and, um, and repeat what it is you're there to do, what it is you want. And if the teacher is uncomfortable with that, then that's probably not a good fit because a teacher is not really that comfortable listening. And you want a teacher that's really comfortable listening to what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, so the second thing is that if you're in the room together, that's a really critical component if you can pull that off. And I've actually, um, I actually did Guthrie Trapp's Artist Works course 
where you can actually film yourself and submit that. And Artist Works is a, a sister organization of a uh, company of True Fires now. And they actually have this unique kind of video exchange program, which is really incredible that you could actually send these famous people like Brian Sutton or Guthrie Trap or Paul Gilbert a video and that they review your video and they make a video reviewing what you're doing and send it back to you. It's not live, but it's certainly if you're in, you know, some far off per place, I was going to name a place. If you're in Albion, New York, it's a place about the size of where I grew up in Lyons, New York. Um, if you're in a place like that and there isn't a teacher, then that's a great alternative. But really, ultimately, you want to be in the same room. Um, they always say that uh, a very large portion of verbal communication is um, is not a, a communication. Spoken communication is nonverbal. It's all this stuff. It's all the emphasis, the pauses, the William Shatnerisms in our in our speaking, if you will. Um, and so you want to be in the room together if you can, so that they can get all of that, um, so that they can also respond and say, yeah, yeah, you're playing that. Those, those are the right notes, but did you try this fingering? You know, you want to do those kinds of things. And that back and forth, I think you could do that in a Skype lesson, but it's hard to get. I mean, I have a very good camera here, et cetera, um, and people tell me how sharp it is, but most people absolutely don't have that. Um, and, and Rick was great at helping with that. Uh, so... Uh, the last thing about live lessons or lessons online where you're doing a regular thing is that I think um, it motivates you from week to week. Um, I, I think I've said it here before. I majored in economics in college and I did it because I didn't understand why people would study money. Um, but it was really helpful to me understanding behavior. It really ends up being more psychology. The more interesting part of it is more psychology. And um, we tend to value the things that we pay for. And if you're paying for regular lessons and you know that you've set yourself an assignment to learn material that way, then that's something that, you, um, that you're that you going to value in a way that you wouldn't value something that you just kind of stumbled on yourself and sort of taught yourself off a video that you found. All right. So those are the live lesson things that I would tell you that you want to keep an eye on. Um, and I actually think I might read next summer, might remake this video um, expanding on the how you do it um, if you're to a certain level you're playing. Because, of course, the method that you need the most has everything to do with um, where you are in your playing journey. Uh, I've had a lot of people that are my age or 10 years younger than me say, yeah, I'm probably not going to break all my bad habits now, but how about I just learn to play these chords the way I play them? Or, you know, I'm going to play with my thumb over. Don't talk to me about getting my thumb behind. Or the opposite, you know, I'm not going to play with my thumb on the top because I learned to play classical and that's it. Um, so um, I'd like, first quiz, I'd like to know from everybody out there and just say um, yes and how old you were. I'd like to know how many of you took um, organized guitar lessons that way of the folks that are out there, put it in the chat. How many of you took guitar lessons and how old were you when you took your first guitar lessons? I think that's a really interesting, um, a really interesting question. And, and while you guys are filling that out, I'm going to scroll back and see if I missed questions as we roll into the first 20 minute mark here. Uh, not so many questions. You guys are talking to each other. That's great. Always encourage the hang, as I say. <laughs> Rob Namunitz says uh, he listens to Rick sometimes. He still has no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, that doesn't really that doesn't really change. I mean, he has an incredible depth. Uh, like I said, I was teasing him that he had post grad work, but he also had grad work, straight up grad work in music theory. And um, he might be. I don't know. I don't think he'd be embarrassed by me telling this. When he was going to go to England Conservatory, uh, I knew him. I mean, I, I knew him in post of that. I didn't know him before he went to New England. But um, he told me that they, he said, well, what are you guys going to make me take? Because he just wanted to play. He just wanted to get there and play with all the good people. And I learned later that he, you know, he did all these duo jazz gigs with Duke Levine and all this kind of stuff. And then he, they said, well, you know, it depends on where you are with your theory and your history. And he goes, well, what if I test out of that? And they kind of laughed and they're like, yeah, nobody tests out of that. So, of course, Rick went home. <laughs> no one tells Rick he can't. 
Rick went home and he studied his tail off all summer and he went back and he tested out of all the theory and he tested out of all the, the jazz theory and all of the history. And so that while he was a student there, he could just take advantage of all the great teachers that were there and all the gigs that were possible and all the great other players that were in school with him at the time. Um, so I love that story. So he, he's, he was to the point where he was teaching himself. All right. I should have asked people to tell me what year it was. Like, I want to know if Charles Copeland started the same year I did. Maybe we'll save that one. That'll be the next quiz when we get through the next session on talking about YouTube and stuff. 21, 12, 12. <laughs> I like that at about 65. I actually have a lot of people who tell me that they have turned, you know, they've gotten serious about guitar. They found my channel and others on YouTube and that they got really into it and they've started taking guitar lessons for the first time ever. Age 11, classical guitar in college. Keith Dooley and I've talked about that, about how they've required us to do that. 23. Started learning from his dad at five. That's wonderful. Phil's taking lessons in Skype. 13. 11 years old. Five. Veronica started taking guitar lessons at five. Veronica, was it a family member? I want to know if that's a family member. That's very cool. John says he started when he was 15, jail trim from an old guy who chain smoked camels. Actually, my, uh, my twinkle little star guy was uh, had a had a had a cigarette in his mouth the whole time. He's kind of like squinting his way through the guitar lessons as I remember it, as the smoke was in his eyes. My good friend Jeff at twelve. I think when I made this original video, I, and I'm going to talk about YouTube and 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 um, you and True Fire. When I made the original, when I wrote the original script, I had Jeff just, just met Jeff Macrolane because it's that long ago that I did that video. It's more like probably close to five years ago. Um, and I said, and, and I didn't even, I had never spoken to Jeff, but I said, um, true fire is so much fun. Jeff McElaine, Robin Ford. I was like, what's better than that? I didn't even know Jeff then. So, um, Victor from Hawaii 13. And then again at 27, you guys can read. So the reality is I tend to go back and take lessons periodically. I've even gone back and taken classical guitar lessons at three different points in my life. I really find it's tremendous for my left hand for um, independence, finger independence. There's shapes that like I would never come across those chord shapes otherwise. Um, so. Veronica says that was 1952. I guess I haven't caught up to find out who Veronica took her lessons with. Uncle, there you go, family member. Uh, Rick just had Matteo Mancuso in the studio uh, for an interview, and it was, um, and his father's a guitarist, a jazz guitarist. And you go, well, you can't become Matteo Mancuso. If you don't know him, you should be checking out this. Um, Rick did an Instagram post from that that has already had like 5 million views, or maybe it was TikTok. And, um, and then he's going to put the interview up in a couple next couple of days. And that's huge. That's huge exposure for Matteo. But if you see this kid play, you just can't, you knew his dad was a guitar player. You can't get there unless you started like Veronica did at five years old. You just can't get there. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff says absolutely nothing better than him and Robin. Absolutely true. I didn't even know. They, I didn't even know they knew each other then. So, um, so YouTube and true fire are two things that that's how I do it now. Um, that's how I've been doing it now. Um, and I think that has to do with if you're at a point where your mechanics are there and you can find the time or make the time in your schedule to do that. I think it's the other thing about, you know, formal lessons is it's hard to, um, to get them scheduled. That's a hard thing to just pull off getting the scheduling done. Um, so I, I think that I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I go and I take uh, things with my all access pass. And actually we're coming up on the halfway point. So I'll do my ad for True Fire as part of this, if you don't think the whole thing is an ad for True Fire, because really you need, if you're in a part of the world where you can't find a local teacher, um, I would say that True Fire or something like True Fire uh, is your best bet. Um, there's such a tremendous variety of teaching there. And I think the key, I've always said, I've only done a little bit of guitar teaching myself, but 
uh, kind of like Rick, where he said he learned all of these things um, because he learned all these tunes. People literally come and say, I want to learn Wonderwall. And he'd have to just like figure it out on the fly. You can imagine the ear training that this was for him too. It was absolutely amazing. Um, so that on the fly, you know, if you've already got the mechanics down, uh, then you can use that all access pass and kind of bounce all around in the catalog. And I think the all access pass, um, whether you get it right through my link, it's, it's a steal anyway, or if you do it on one of the, do one of the big sales, um, you can then go looking. And my thing is like, I have sort of fleeting interests. Like I'll, I want to play slide. I'll hear somebody, you know, Harrison or somebody who plays just a little bit of slide. And I'm like, oh man, I really should learn it. God, I love that sound. And I was really into Indian music when I was in college. I'm like, that, that's a, that's a great sound. I should go do that. I go listen to Derek trucks, et cetera. And so, and I, but I don't own that course, but I can go take that course. Um, so, um, and you, and true fire was my answer. And this is the segue to the ad. True fire was my answer to this when I lived, when I moved from my home in Burlington, Vermont, where there were lots of really good guitar teachers and Kevin Boyer was teaching me rock lessons at a time in my life where I was 40 something years old and I'd never learned all the rock tunes. A guy who was 40 something should have learned it when he was a teenager. I, I just didn't do that. I was into this real folky thing when I first started playing guitar. Um, so uh, I had a great teacher there, but then I moved up into the mountains in New Hampshire and I couldn't find a teacher for the longest time. And so that's when I started using True Fire. And I went ahead and I signed up for the all access pass. I remember when I was negotiating my deal with True Fire and they offered me an all access pass. And I kind of went, um, I already have an all access pass. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but we'd pay for it. I'm like, oh, okay, well, okay, that's part of the deal. You know, um, that was a great thing because I was already doing those. And I spend time with that. That's, you've seen my little setup. If you follow me on Instagram, I have an, uh, a music stand, you know, like if you had gone to music school, I'd have stolen it from my music school, but I had to buy my own Manhasset stand. I have a real nice music stand and I have my iPad there. And uh, somebody was commenting on the thumbnail last week. They're like, is that music? Is that music on the music stand? It's actually, that's a printout of tablature from a John Cordy video. I'm going to come to that in a minute. Um, but the True Fire All Access, I think, is a really great way to do it. If in addition to that, um, signing up for that and doing that, in addition to that, you keep yourself excited by following some of these YouTubers. And I just don't know anybody else like John Cordy who puts out so many videos. Um, well, actually, I'll take it back right away. Um, John does that all the time. But I would freely admit that John uh, probably, John has a shred and kind of metal background that I don't share. So um, I would say probably 25% of the stuff that John does, especially the all of the Eric Johnson Cordell stuff that he does, is why I'm there. I absolutely love it. I love the all of the um the tones and all of that stuff i absolutely love all of those parts the technology part of what john does on the channel is great but my really favorite thing is when he starts breaking down eric johnson intros to cliffs of dover or i as i am going to start bugging him to do breaks down like the chord sections from a pat metheny trio record where metheny would just come out on stage and then just kind of play and and i was talking to rick about this the other day about how much of that is improvised and how much is worked out. And I want to get to the point, and his theory was that it, a lot of it is improvised, that they they can hear the chord structures move by, they can um, they know where those notes are, their familiarity with the fingerboard is at such a level where when they hear a modulation, they know just where that is under their hands and what the notes are. I mean, that's the thing with Eric Johnson when you're watching his videos on True Fire and he's saying, you know, well, you go here and then you, you have this chord and then you make a sharp 11 by just doing this, raising the fourth. And you're like, okay, I don't know what note that was. So I wouldn't know to, I didn't know which was the fourth. Um, and you've also heard me say probably that I'm dyslexic a little bit. And so the letters for names of notes is a lot harder than me than intervals. Don't ask me why it's just a wiring thing. So um, the fact that somebody like Eric Johnson is talking about the interval and the note is absolutely amazing to me. Um, so those are the things that I like the most. And the way I get it from um, John Cordy uh, is through his Patreon. And John's Patreon is like five bucks a month. And he does a video every day. So even if you only were getting, and you can download the tablatures from his Patreon account. So even if you were doing that, like I do, as in addition to my True Fire All Access Pass, um, that would be, and that hopefully that is kind of the way I'm going to do it. I haven't talked to him about it, but I've actually thought about 
uh, talking to John about um, doing some Skype lessons with him, although I can't believe he's got the time. I know that during COVID, he actually did a little of that to sort of supplement um, his income. He was doing some Skype lessons with people. And it would be interesting to, um, to do that, um, to take some lessons. And he has a much deeper theory background. And inevitably, when I'm having a conversation with John or, or Rick, they're like, you just need to study. You just need to memorize <laughs> a bunch of your theory or memorize the notes on the key on the fretboard to an extent that you have not yet. Um, so I think that the um, I think that the last thing I'm ripping through today. I, I, I guess I didn't have as much material because I was doing so much editing. Um, let me make sure I'm not missing stuff over here. You guys are having a good conversation. Veronica says she's been playing guitar for 72 years. Well, if you start when you're five, you get you get a real jump on everybody else. Uh, Chris Butler's reminding us that John is starting to do some jazz stuff again. Yeah, and and John was never in the jazz coma that I was in. So I've suggested some tunes to him and I was delighted to hear him what come back out with his, uh, he has an evolving arrangement of In the Wee Small Hours, which was a tune that I, I turned him on to because it's one of my favorite jazz ballads. Um, Bill Gross says, I now use True Fire for rock, blues classical, tone bass for classical, tone bass, that's someone I don't know, for classical master classes and classical guitar shed which took me to advanced level, all these things in the last six to 10 years. That's great. Oop, I spun the wrong way there. That's fantastic. I love that you guys are sharing these things with each other. Bill Shea saying John, pa John Cordy's Patreon is one of the best deals in good car world. That's absolutely true. I was saying the same thing. So the thing that I didn't talk about, but has been incredibly fun for me too, and then I'm going to talk about one other thing, which is tracking this stuff for two reasons, um, is uh, I took those True Fire courses with Jeff. And over the time that I've known Jeff, he sort of evolved his teaching. He still does True Fire things, but more often he's doing uh, monthly master classes, or sometimes even more often than that. And those master classes have become wildly successful. And I think even Jeff is amazed at how successful they've become, but he shouldn't be because he's kind of like my friend Rick in that these guys have been doing it for a long time. Um, and I say it sometimes, and I don't know if he's embarrassed by it, but the reality is at this point in his life, Jeff McElaine is one of the best guitar teachers on the planet. There's no way around it. He's been doing it so long and he's um, taught such a wide variety of music. Um, that there's no way around the fact that his um, his approach, his knowledge about how to get the information across, tricks of the trade as far as teaching you ways to do it. Um, I should have a sit down with with Jeff about what it is I need to work on, where the holes are in my in my playing, because I think that has a lot to do um, with the strength of both like Rick when he was a teacher, but Jeff absolutely has that going on all the time. Um, and because of those master classes, I've sat in on some kind of try to hang back in the back row. Um, there is an exchange. There's a back and forth. Um, there's time for questions. Let me say that. I mean, there's so many people on a master class that you can't. It's like a master class in a room at a music school where you'd have 100 students coming in, you know, for that whole freshman class is there with. Oh, I was in one at Ithaca College one time with Marion McPartland and, um, and Steve Brown and other people like that. And, and you get to ask your questions. Um, it's not the same as somebody reviewing your individual lessons and Jeff's kind of at the level where he's, he's not, he doesn't have time to do that now. I know he has a very few students still, but he really doesn't have time. But then, excuse me, the master classes give you access to Jeff in a way that's really kind of amazing still. Um, let me see. If, if you got questions, throw them out here and I'll do them. <laughs> I love it. You guys refer to each other so much. Excellent. Okay. So the last thing, you know, I took all my phones out of the room <clears throat> because I'm on a live stream. Um, one of the last things that I was going to say that I talked about in that original video, and if I remake it, I'll probably talk about different ways of doing it, um, is that if you don't, uh, well, I used to, I had this job, I had a couple jobs actually, which spent a lot of time doing analytics. 
and there was this guy named Peter Drucker. He's this um, famous, you know, uh, industry guy, industrial guy, industrial measurement guy uh, from the seventies. And Drucker said, if it matters, you measure it. And so in addition to having something which would make me sort of weekly pra practice and, and work on my progress, um, as an aid to my practice, when I did this, I was using the application on my phone that tracked the number of days a week that I was doing yoga or meditating, trying to do some breath work and calm down my crazy mind, my, you know, scattered brain that I have. Um, I just read a book. I think I mentioned this maybe last week. I read a book called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari that I highly recommend everybody. I'm going to be doing a video about all the reasons we're finding it hard to focus. And I'm going to talk about that here too. Um, but I use this timer, this app, this thing called Insight Timer, and you can create different types of activities, whether it's exercise or going to the gym or sitting and meditating or yoga, and you can name them, you know, within categories. And then at the end of the week or at the end, you can get summaries for the week or the month or for the year. You can see how much time in a color bar, like in a histogram, a, a bar chart, um, how much time you spent meditating and how much time you spent playing guitar and how much time you guitar if you've created a category. And that's what I did for a long time. For like a couple of years, I did that um, at the beginning of the channel when I was really focusing on taking True Fire lessons online and those kinds of things because I wanted to track my progress and it did matter to me. And so I wanted to measure it and I wanted to be able to easily see where it was that I was you know, getting to. Um, so I use this app called Insight Timer. It, it was free. I think it's still free. I think it is like five bucks a month if you want to get all the all the uh, reports and things. Uh, I, did, I would encourage everybody to go all hippie like me. And uh, my hair is getting pretty long here again. Uh, and, um, and think about doing the breath work because it's incredible help to your focus. Um, and that's one of the things that I need to say is one of the best reasons to keep playing guitar. And it's one of the reasons best reasons I've heard in a long time to practice guitar, to sit and practice. Um, turning on that timer, that insight timer, going through the mechanisms of turning it on, it didn't, it reminded me that I wasn't just playing guitar, I was focusing on playing guitar, that um, I had a better way of saying it here. Turning on the timer reminds me in that moment, I'm not just playing guitar, I'm working on my guitar playing. Yeah, see, I was a better writer four years ago. Um, I'm working on my guitar playing and practicing as Rick always is quick to remind us, every good teacher will remind you that you should practice the things that you don't know how to play already. That when you're just noodling, you're not practicing, you're just noodling and you're making music. And if my buddy Tim Lurch was here, he'd say, you know, that's great. It's really important part of your musicianship to practice things that you love hearing. That's a big part of why we do it in general. But it's important to recognize that there are different parts of practice. And I'll remind everybody that I did a live stream with Tim where Tim talked about his own theories of practice. And he's a very, very thoughtful guy. And that's a great live stream. So go back and check that out. Um, I really like that. Um, so I encourage people to think about, and I'm going to start using the Insight Timer version again. I'm sure there's lots of other ways that you could, other apps, maybe even the Apple Health app. I don't know, other ways that you could use technology to do that and then um, and then work that out, all right? Okay, so I'm gonna do some questions that we're at 440 here, and then I have sort of a summing up uh, idea here. Let me see. <laughs> Cushman doesn't know that I used to block people for questions about my facial hair. Let's see if I can get back there. There. What kind of a beard trimmer? I just use a regular beard trimmer. I looked up a, um, I looked up a video about it. And I did, I bought what they told me to buy. So look it up. There's a guy that did a video on beards for GQ that uh, emboldened me to do it. Um, Phil says, does tracking it really help? It really helped me. Um, you know, look, <laughs> maybe it's my good, solid Catholic upbringing of guilt. Um, I have a pretty strong um, sense of if I'm going to pay for something, I better do it. If I'm going to measure it, it reminds me that it matters. So um, it's a, that's sort of a circular thing. And I think that is a really important thing. So uh, Rob Nwinowitz wants to know if I watched Ozzy and Harriet. I'm not quite old enough to have watched Ozzy and Harriet, but I don't remember how old you are, Rob. So I'm, I'm going to not think that's an, an insult <laughs> about my age. 
Joel Parks, my buddy Joel says, I think what you are describing is intentionality. Yeah, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Being wise and intentional about how you use your time and attention. Right. It goes back to the thing I said. I think it's from um, what's McKeon's first name. This guy wrote a book called Essentialism. And I don't think this I, he's probably quoting somebody else when he says, um, if you don't make a plan for yourself, someone will make a plan for you. And I think that that's something we don't spend enough time on. I had an interesting conversation with Rick today. There's, I follow a number of different channels that I think do a good job. And there's a channel that actually does slow fashion, this idea that, you know, it's a minimalism angle. It's like, you don't need as many clothes as you think, or as the industry would tell you need, blah, blah, blah. And she was talking about having three words that describe your style. And, and really what she's talking about is having a moment to look at who you are and um, pick three words that do the best job of describing who you are in your clothing style. But I thought that would be very applicable to playing guitar. And the way she recommended that you do it, and her name's Alyssa Bell Tempo. Um, if you did three words, you'd find this video that I'm talking about and see if you can apply it to guitar. Because the reality is, she says to things like, go in your closet and see what's there and look at the things that make you happiest. And I'm like, well, that applies to playing guitar. You go in and you look at the kind of stuff when you sit down, what do you typically want to play? Why do you play those things? Why are those your favorite things to play? What are those things that are your favorite things to listen to? And I think it's a fascinating exercise to think about the intentionality thing that Joel's talking about. The, the important thing is actually taking a look at who you are. Um, <laughs> Hot Wax says, the noodling, the focus, the yin and the yang. Yeah, well, you're, you're taking me back to school here. So anyway, I think it's fascinating that we spend some time. Um, yeah, it, that you'd spend some time um, thinking about who you are as a player is the beginning of deciding where you want to get to as a player. And I'm not I'm not shaming anybody. If you're happy with the playing that you do and like me on an acoustic, I am trying to get a little better on acoustic and I'm certainly learning more songs and those kinds of things. And I'm hosting the jam here this week. And there's actually somebody locally who's going to come to the jam for the first time as I'm hosting. I can invite a guest sometimes, uh, even though it's not my organized. That doesn't matter. Anyway, um, that's something that I kind of do already. I, I have goals for that that really have to do with, frankly, improving my singing and improving my harmony singing. But it's the reason I enjoy it so much is because it's together with other people. So um, Michael Vadenhoff from... Uh, the Netherlands says, do the things you like without clocking, but feeling good about it. Yeah, I agree, Michael. I, I don't think that the clock should always be running. And I think Tim Lurch's video about that would agree that you don't always need to be, um, uh, you don't always need to be thinking about learning new things. You should always enjoy the playing the things you do. Um, I had bird dogs for a long time. And when you train a dog and he's not getting it, first you want to have, let him, give him time to think about it. Um, and the second thing is if he's, he's not getting it, you want to fall back to something he can do well. And I think that applies to all of us. It's like, you want to end on a high note. You want to end not a literal high note, but maybe, uh, you want to end on a note where you feel good about playing, where you get back to, this is why I, I, I appreciate this. Um, Bill Sanderson said, does it make sense? Let me show this here. Does it make sense to divide practice time between theory, earning new, learning new songs, and practicing scales, thoughts. Um, Rick did a video years ago where he talks about the percentage of time he thinks that you should spend on um, repertoire. In other words, learning new songs. Percentage of time you should spend on just straight mechanical technique. Percentage of time you should um, practicing and learning new. He kind of doesn't differentiate between scales and theory. Um, not scales, but theory and application of theory. So you're working on that as a part of it. Honestly, that's been a long time since I watched that video. You guys are encouraging me to go back and watch it again as I'm encouraging you to do it. Um, because I think that those those are interesting things. I won't say that we're not all at the same balance level. Um, and or, I don't know, maybe I would have to have on maybe to talk about practicing. Um, to um, I was going to say maybe everybody's not at the same place as far as what they need to work on. But maybe Maybe we are. Maybe there's always something more. One of the great things about playing the guitar is there's always something more to learn. You've always got that that dopamine hit waiting for you if you take the time to learn it. 
I'm going to do you get I'm getting some kind of random questions, which is cool. We can do that the last 15 minutes. Let me just wrap up my my lessons thought. I got two things. Um, the investor Warren Buffett um, always reminds us that if people ask him about investing and the first thing he always says that you should invest in yourself, that you should invest in school and that it's the best place to put your money. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful thing. It's also coming from a guy who started investing when he was 13 years old. Um, but it really, I mean, his, the other part of his lesson is that he just stayed at it. Uh, I read recently that 90% of Buffett's wealth came after he turned 60 years old because of compounding. So the, the message of that is that he did it for so long, not that he was a genius, but that he stayed in and he got the balance of compounding. I would say that learning things is compounding too. Um, inevitably, you pull things together and that creates a compounding thing. Um, actually, I didn't say it. Kurt Schaffensberg is saying he keeps a guitar diary. The other reason I did, I'm doing this lessons thing is I have a friend of five watt that I do uh, a monthly meeting with. And, um, and Dan has such a regimented schedule for working on this stuff that I have to say that he's, um, he's kind of inspired me to think about going back to the insight timer thing and stuff and doing that again. And frankly, taking some lessons because he works a schedule for himself where he's always stretching. And he's at the point where he's doing pretty elaborate theory exercises. And he does um, every day he does things um, that's interesting. So anyway, so the, the Warren Buffett thing, the, the whole emphasis on learning things and trying to track what we're learning is a big thing. Uh, so I wrote your knowledge and hence lessons is always a better investment than new gear. Gee, we're right back to the channel, to the channel trailer. We hope that buying new gear would change our playing, but we know that taking new lessons or wearing some new things will. And people always quickly come back to, um, I don't have any money for lessons, to which I have always said, uh, my suggestion is to look around and I'll bet you have a couple of petals that you could identify gathered that are gathering dust that could be flipped for a couple hundred dollars that could pay for that all access pass or could then pay for some private lessons. Even if you just take a couple of months worth of private lessons. I used to take uh, after I um, left Ithaca College and I worked at Binghamton, I would go up and I would Rick had moved away. I would go take a lesson with Steve Brown and it would last like two or three hours. And I'd go away for six months and work on the material. And that was partly because I was very busy. But it also was that if you're at a certain level, you can get so much material that you can, that you really are going to take a long time to, uh, to digest it. All right. So let me do the, let me do the questions that are here, uh, that I haven't done. <laughs> Chris Sean says, uh, Ozzie and Harriet was in syndication for decades and decades. I might've seen it on the Nick and Knight. Okay. So this is where I tell you or remind you, depending that after I left college, I never had television again. I have cable. And I watch a lot of movies and I watch movies. I, I, I just will binge with the rest of you, you know, on, on Netflix or something. I have all of that. But for a long, long, long time, I didn't have television at all because um, I was such a, a vigorous reader. Um, and so so I kind of miss a lot of TV cultural jokes. And mostly I've seen um, uh Ozzie and Harriet references around uh, Ricky Nelson and James Burton, <laughs> to tell you the truth. So uh, we got a top chat here and I'm way behind. Mojo67 said, got a barber, a barber five watt bus overdrive and absolutely loves it. Yeah, we're starting to get a little traction on the gear page. We weren't getting much noise on the gear page at first. I think people got them and they loved them and they just quietly sat home and played them. Um, and now they're starting to talk about it. Um, fishy fish. How do you find mentors for music? Uh, somebody was telling me that they use this meetup app in some, if you're in a big enough city, there's lots of different meetup groups. Um, I've always used music stores and I, music stores are getting harder to find, but mom and pop music stores, um, or even the local, uh, box stores, um, will often have a bulletin board where you can try to find people to do that. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Ish Guitars here and Ish gets a lot of cool people coming through so you can find people to do things that way. Um, I actually, I think you need to be more shameless about just inviting people to get together to play the guitar. Um, we need to be less shy about playing, I think. Um, I think that's a big thing and, and I, I think that can make a big difference. I've made a lot of musician friends over the years doing that. Mr. Dooley, 
Thank you for the top chat, Mr. Keith. It says, I practice new things for writing new material, not so much learning other people's songs. That's been my challenge, learning and applying new theory. Yeah, Keith has actually got a real, a real theory thing like my friend Dan um, and these other you know, people that are in Friends of Five Watt. I actually learned that a new friend of Five Watt today um, actually lives right down the road from me. And I, 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 this guy also, you know, is in touch with people like Zach Childs and stuff. So I wrongly assumed that he lived in East Nashville or, um, or you know, someplace out west. Uh, nope, he, he's right here. So, um, so I'm looking forward to getting together with him when he's back in town. Uh, Victor Beebe says, didn't they do a song at the end of the show? I think you're talking about the Ricky Nelson thing. They they played all the time. I didn't watch the show all the time. So you're going to have to have somebody that did watch the show uh, thing. Jason Carter says, Facebook usually has a local musicians pages like they do there in Stuttgart. That's great. Excellent. I want to make sure I've got all the questions. <laughs> just playing bass says if you sound bad i'm editing if you sound bad on your existing gear you'll sound bad on the new gear i think that's a very uh, none too subtle way of saying go take you some lessons i agree rob says new gear can inspire new explorations yeah for me um one of the thing one of the big things for me of buying fewer pedals because i think pedals is the thing that most of us can fall down on and just you know snarf up and kind of lose track of how much they add up to um was having a stomp if i want to go like play univibe i didn't go buy a univibe i just go turn that on and try to find some inspiration there <laughs> again i gotta go to john cordy my buddy john is doing these um doing these patches all the time and he gives all those presets away for his five dollar patreon a month so if you want to get inspired and try some different sounds, you even got a guy demoing these sounds for the ones he creates as he goes along. Um, he's one of the hardest working men in YouTube. There's no way around it. Um, somebody asked, oh, I got a question here from Charles Copeland says, do you get any from Guitar Technique Magazine? I don't, I don't do that because I, I don't find that um, the magazines are in a vein of music that I'm interested in. But I know a lot of people have had real good luck with that over the years, especially if you're into rock or, you know, more uh, shred kind of stuff. Uh, there was a question back here about, well, somebody wanted to know about the Princeton Tone Master. Um, so really briefly, um, I have the Tone Master back in the living room along with my Rev D25. Um, I find the Tone Master, I've, I've rehoused it in a Mojo Tone cab that takes a 12 inch speaker. I put a ne uh, Mojo Tone Neo British Blues speaker, um, which I found helped kind of round out the edges of the criticism that most people say about that amp that it's too high fi i'd be interested in trying like a 10 inch greenback in the original cabinet sometime um but i actually want to try some other speakers in the d25 to see if i can make it even lighter than it is um to make it sort of a great gigging thing because it has the two notes out and it's and it's right the right amount of wattage and all these kinds of things and as i talked about uh on my last week's stream it has um, a lot of features that I always loved from the guys at Rev and now they've built it into this little combo and they brought my buddy Sean Tubbs into the game. So I think it's just really, uh, that, that's a really cool little piece. And so that's the piece that I'm exploring right now. So, all right. <laughs> Joel's, Joel's telling me I, I screwed up that I should have kept the 10. Well, you know, I can, I can put a different battle. I get baffle again. Um, Del Noah says, how often do you forget songs you've learned? Any tips for retaining them? Uh, Del, I'm terrible. Um, the guys in my acoustic group laugh at me because I show up with a three ring binder of tunes that I'm working on. And sometimes if it's a tune that's got a few um, grown up chords, I hand out the tunes around the room that we're going to run through and everybody's doing it um, just from scratch. So, um, you know, they've never seen these tunes and they might they tend to know them because they tend to have more shared background around uh, bluegrass and stuff than I have. Well, it's been a long time since I played bluegrass or listened to bluegrass and I never was a flat picker per se like that anyway. Um, I, the only thing I can suggest is what I do now, which is um, I play them over and over and over again. I will say, <laughs> I cross my arms and get all defensive. I will say that I think that 
playing them in front of other people, the emotional content that comes from that, having to perform a song um, and being able to rehearse it with people who, you know, I'm not in, up on a stage. Uh, I think it puts it in my memory in a different way than just sitting in my house singing by myself does. Um, I, I, doing that monthly with the guys, um, and it's to the point where there's some people who say, you know, hey, play, play, um, play that William Prince song that you that you play, Breathless, because it's in D, and then I can play fiddle on that tune. And and I, I love it that we all kind of are supporting each other in that way. But I'll tell you that then what I do is when I sit down. And it's just me and my girlfriend at home because she loves to have me play guitar and sing. Um, then, then I try to do the tunes without it. Or like I just got together with my family and we hadn't had a big family jam for a long, long time. And, um, and we were able to do that again. And then a couple of tunes I did from memory. Um, and then, you know, the, the family's calling tunes out that I haven't played in a long time and everybody doesn't have the sheet. Um, so I'm actually building a new book for the family to do that. So. Uh, yeah, performance is being alive, uh, Rob. That's the truth. Yeah, Ray Luttinger's saying the same thing that I was saying, which is play those songs for someone else. And I think that that does really put those in your head. Um, yeah, red light is tough. And and, and I actually think, um, I actually think that, um, I, I mean, I still get nervous for this. I do this every week. And I always said when I did, I used to do very large presentations. You know, I would talk to 400 nervous parents about their son or daughter's um, orientation when I was in higher education. And it was like you could, it was palpable. The, the emotion in the room was palpable. And, um, and I used to get nervous for those too. And I, people would say, you know, they couldn't tell I was nervous. And the, the reality is, um, I was nervous and I used to say this with the jazz gig too, which I did every week for five years. Um, the piano player who was, I used to tease Gene, he was the Buddha of the band business because he had been doing it for a long time, that if it matters, you get nervous. If it matters, it matters enough to worry about it. Um, so I, that's where I'm going to go with, it's okay to get nervous. Uh, I love this, Rob. Thanks for sharing that. He says, I'm too shy to play in front of my wife. She's seen me when I was playing for money. <laughs> I, I don't even, I, I don't know where to start <laughs> with, with the, <laughs> the transactional nature of like, maybe, maybe she could pay five bucks to do the tunes at home. I don't know. I think, I think playing in front of people in your family um, are, um, I think that playing in front for people in front of your family is the people that, are matter, matter, both matter to you most in the world and hopefully are the most forgiving of your humanity of, uh, or, or celebrate your humanity, if you will. So, boy, we're really ending on a, on a, on a sappy note here. And I like it. I, I like that as we're going to go here. I appreciate everybody being here today. Um, and uh, I didn't ask John if I could use his music again. <laughs> so, um, and I, I just hope that everybody uh, takes a minute and thinks about it, it's going to help us all learn to pay attention and focus on everything in our life. If we spend some time where we spend 15 whole minutes thinking about playing guitar, as opposed to the two seconds on average, we might swipe on something on Instagram. All right. Okay. So I'm going to play that little tiny 30 second clip of John again, and uh, thank everybody for being here. Remember to use the links in the description to um, go ahead and sign up for True Fire or grab merch or whatever works for you. Um, and use the links in the description here so that True Fire knows you got there from me. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, I will talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.